contributions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. A very good Friday afternoon to you and welcome to the show. I'm Vanessa Feltz. This is what's coming up. Well, obviously, it wouldn't be right for me to comment on police matters, but as I've said previously, what he said was wrong and racist, and he rightfully has apologised for it. The Tory racism row rumbles on. Police launch an investigation into the comments Frank Hester allegedly made about former Labour MP Diane Abbott, but the Prime Minister refuses to comment at all. Plus, the army recruitment crisis. Thousands of youngsters are giving up on their applications to serve in Britain's armed forces because it takes months to join. And leave our flag alone. The government's accused the FA of toying with the country's heritage after including a multicoloured St George's cross on England's new football kit. First of all, though, let's have the news headlines with Nadira Tudor. Good afternoon. West Yorkshire police are investigating alleged racist comments made by a Conservative Party donor about Diane Abbott. Businessman Frank Hester is accused of saying in 2019 that the Labour MP should be shot. He has apologised but insisted his remarks had nothing to do with gender or skin colour. Conservative candidate Alex Dean told Talk TV that returning the donation is complicated. No, I think... Um... The money going back to somebody who you said was racist and wrong seems a really weird outcome. I think it's very hard to justify hanging on to it, but I don't think it can just be given back to someone because you agree yeah. they're a racist or have been, sorry, have said something that's racist. The Football Association has defended the St George's Cross design on the New England kit, saying it's not the first time different colours have been used. The blues and purples have caused huge uproar. The PM said Nike shouldn't mess with our national flags. And Sir Keir Starmer has even called for the official Euro kit to be recalled. The UN Security Council has rejected calls by the US for a ceasefire in Gaza, with China and Russia voting against it. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken has been in Israel to push for it. It follows a joint statement from the UK and Australia warning of the potentially devastating consequences of a ground offensive in southern Gaza. The family of a British woman who has been missing for three years in the US Virgin Islands are pleading for help from President Biden to find her. Sam Heslop disappeared from the catamaran of her then-boyfriend Ryan Bain in March 2021. Her friend Andrew Baldwin told Talk TV they're still trying to piece together what has happened. Three years ago on the 8th of March, uh, Sam went missing uh, in the Caribbean. She was... Uh, living on a yacht and working on a yacht of her boyfriend, uh, Ryan Bain. Uh, and at 2 a.m. in the morning, uh, she allegedly went missing. Uh, Mr. Bain uh, reported it to the police that she had gone missing and then um, failed to report it to the Coast Guard for nine hours, uh, allegedly inferring that Sam had fallen off of the boat. A man who murdered a couple with opioid fentanyl has been jailed for life. Luke DeWitt, who worked for Stephen and Carol Baxter, poisoned them with the painkiller and rewrote their will to leave their business to him. DeWitt will serve at least 37 years behind bars. And a recent study has found puberty is responsible for making teenagers' armpits smell like cheese, goat and even urine. Scientists have singled out the chemical compounds that cause the bad odours. It's hoped that the discovery could lead to the development of more effective and targeted deodorants. Those are the headlines now. Here's Joe Wheeler with the weather. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. 
Hello there. You could be forgiven for thinking that spring has arrived. We've seen temperatures up to 18 degrees Celsius in the last week, but it's all changed this weekend as that area of cloud and rain crossing southern parts brings much colder air from the north. Now, that cold air is already over Scotland. Sunshine and showers there, but those showers arriving on gale force winds, so it's going to feel pretty perishing with temperatures in fairly low single figures. Meanwhile, the southeast will brighten up, perhaps just before nightfall, uh, but certainly clearer skies are overnight. So those showers just keep coming from the northwest, some of them heavy, thundery, uh, could be some hail mixed in and turning wintry over the higher ground as well. Temperatures overnight low enough for a touch of frost, but most places will escape frost free on account of there being too much breeze. And indeed, that wind will pick up even more through the course of Saturday. And so we're looking at a significant wind chill for many parts of the country, but perhaps most noticeable in the south. So for everybody, sunshine and showers, the wintriness extending down into the Pennine over the higher ground of Wales and temperatures in the south probably reaching around 8 or 9 degrees Celsius but feeling more like 4 or 5 in the wind chill. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Many thanks to Nadira and to Joe. Let's move straight to our top story now. Police have launched an investigation into alleged comments made by a major Conservative Party donor about former Shadow Home Secretary Diane Abbott. West Yorkshire Police says it's investigating after businessman Frank Hester reportedly said Miss Abbott, the UK's longest serving black MP, made him, and I quote, want to hate all black women and that she should be shot. The force says it is working to establish if a crime has been committed. The alleged remarks, first reported by The Guardian, were said to have been made during a company meeting in 2019. Mr Hester has said he is deeply sorry for the rude comments, but insists they had nothing to do with the Hackney MP's gender or the colour of her skin. The row has caused outrage in Westminster, with opposition members of Parliament demanding the Conservatives return a £10 million donation. But he's also reported to have donated an additional £5 million to the Tories since the start of this year, which the party has not denied. While launching his local election campaign in Derbyshire today, Rishi Sunak avoided answering when challenged on whether it was time to return any of the money. Well, obviously, it wouldn't be right for me to comment on police matters, but as I've said previously, what he said was wrong and racist, and he rightfully has apologised for it. Joining me now in the studio, former advisor to Michael Gove, Charlie Rowley, and down the line, we're joined by broadcaster and writer Edward Adu. Good to see you both. Thank you so much. Edward, good to good have you on the programme. I haven't seen you for far too long. Um, now, this is a story that has gone on and on, hasn't it? And I know with the first day we dealt with it on this programme, all my guests in the studio, in fact, were united, and all of them said, there's no discussion here. This money has to be returned. The Tories must return it. And when I said, and what if they don't, they thought it was so unconscionable, the very notion that they might not, that they barely even wanted to discuss it, so convinced were they, all these political pundits and experts, that the money would simply have to go back. Well, the money hasn't gone back, has it? So I wonder what you think about this now being the matter of a police investigation and what you feel about the response so far, Edward? Well, the whole case is just, it's just disastrous. And, and the reason why I wrote an op-ed piece for, for The Voice, as soon as I heard what happened, it just made me think straight away of well, my mum, aunties, relatives, and generally everybody, brothers and sisters within the black community, that it felt as if it was, a, it was an attack. Because if those, type, if those actions can be more or less endorsed or, more, or swept under the carpet where we've been told uh, continuously we need to move on, that will certainly spark or it will be inflammatory to not just the, the black community, but to, to other face and, and, and races in the UK. When it comes down to the money specifically, it does make you think that, well, certainly if you are a donor and if you have power, then you can make those types of remarks and it will be excused. And I think it, it, it kind of certainly to, to well, to, to a, a societal view to say for what he said, um, more or less kind of endorsing it and saying, well, look, if you have power, you have money, you have status, you can, you, you, you can say that. And it took a long time for the Prime Minister to, Rishi Sunak, to come out and say, well, look, in actual fact, this, this is racist. All the ministers that were doing the rounds on that particular day on 
all the various TV channels refuse to call it. On I, I heard interviews on from breakfast through till uh, drive time, not on radio and TV. And when ministers were asked, "Do you think this is racist?" or they kept on saying, "Well, well, look, this it's 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 alleged for for um, uh, Mr. Hester to have said that." And then it took Kemi Badenoch, who kind of said, "Look, let's call it for what it is," and she said, "Look, I have." You know, Diane Abbott, obviously, Labour, regardless of the uh, political allegiance here, what was said is is wrong. And I think that's the issue. It, it took them a long time. And I think it's kind of, it's troubling for the Conservatives because in 2017, 2018, I was called by when Mike Hancock was Digital Minister to um, be part of a panel to look into diversity. And obviously, this was under the stewardship of uh, Theresa May. So clearly, the Conservatives back then were trying to um, make what well, steps or measures to try and to, cl to 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 make sure that the UK is representative of of, of, of all the four communities. All right, well, shed, a bit, shed a bit I of think, light on this for me, uh, Edward. Shed, yeah. shed a bit of light on this. So you're called by Theresa May's government in a capacity to um, attempt to encourage or to facilitate diversity. How do you do that? In, in, in what sort of sphere was it meant to be? And how did they envisage you helping to facilitate or bring about more diversity? Firstly, what did you actually do? Well, firstly, it was a, a discussion at a DCMS in Whitehall. There were lots of diversity heads. And it was more or less saying, look, what is happening now? How can we reflect or the, uh, the UK or all, all the set, well, different sectors, uh, broadcasting, sports? And, and they asked for my view. And I, and I said, look, based on my experience, you know, trying to get into broadcasting for many years, and luckily I've got the platform now, mm. but it was tricky to get in. And it was at a time where it felt very much like a boys' club. I remember being told once by, when I was cutting my teeth through uh, student radio, by a boss of a, of a station that, look, you must be, you should, you should feel fortunate working here, because if not, you'd be sweeping the streets. So... Go. Wow. Well, I, I remember. I remember something very similar. I remember being told by a boss um, years ago um, that I would never cross over. Now, you might wonder what wow. I would be crossing over from, and that was that well, I was Ju very... I was Jewish, and so I better just stay in my lane, and I better be very, very pleased to present one Jewish program a week, and not to even dream or think about crossing over because how could you possibly, if you were Jewish, and just you, be and lucky Vanessa, to present proved, a Jewish program? Vanessa, you've you've proved them wrong and I'm glad that you, you've certainly, if they're watching this now, I'm sure they'd be embarrassed. And the problem with, it's the mindset. And this is the issue which has cropped up again with Hester's comments, where there is a minority who have that mindset and think that, well, certainly their power, they're inferior to everybody. And mm -hmm. if th those, those people, very powerful, middle-class, affluent, white males, who can say comments and say things like that. And this is where it needs to be stamped out, that you can't say things like that because we're not living in those But tell um, me something, treacherous Edward. Times. You know, very often on this programme, I'm going to bring in Charlie in a minute, obviously, very often on this programme we talk about lawlessness. We talk about, for example, if your house is burgled, if your phone is stolen, if your you know, place of work is broken into, the chances, and if you're, if you're a woman and you're sexually assaulted, the chances are that they will not find the, 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 the perpetrator and they're very unlikely to look very hard or very carefully for the perpetrator. So people are saying effectively there are whole areas and arenas of life where lawlessness prevails because they're never going to bring the criminal to book. And so, you know, they pretty much got carte blanche. Another big one these days is shoplifting, where we know that if you shoplift something, that's under £200 in value, pretty much you get a, a pat on the back and sent on your merry way. You know, there's no kind of comeback for, 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 for people who do this kind of a, a thing. So because of that, some people might be wondering, is it worth police investigating Frank Hester? You know, we know what he's alleged to have said. The whole country's got a view on it. Is it worth using police time, using police resources to research what a multimillionaire said in a meeting at his work in 2019? Do you think this is a good use of money? Well, Vanessa, if somebody said that on the bus and if they were allowed to get away with it, what does that say about us as a, as a society, that we're allowing that form of, of language? And to be fair, it's, it's a form of the government now talking about clamping down on extremism by saying that. His comments was in reference to every black woman in this country. 
And that, that's it's a, it's a shocking thing. No one should ever, ever should ever say that. So if we allow one person to get away with it, whether it should be investigated or, or taken further, in a sense, if nothing is done about it, and this kind of rhetoric of people saying, well, it, we need to move on. In a sense, if, if we're saying we have, it has to be moved on, we're saying that we are endorsing so, so a, racism. So, A, do you think the money should be given back? It certainly hasn't been given back, and the Prime Minister's got no intention of returning it, but do you feel it should be given back? And B, do you think Hester should be prosecuted for hate speech or inciting hate, racism or something of that kind? I'm going to start with the second point and go back to the first point, because you know me sometimes, I'm a bit complicated. Okay. I think the when it comes to the, the, um, whether the prosecution, that's a matter of the police. Clearly, if they've got the facts and the evidence, and if they deem it to be well racist or or, or, ex, or extremist or in in that in that context, mm. then by all means they should take the matter further. When it comes down to the money, I think again that's down to the, to the conservative. It, it's down to common sense and I think um, and logic. And I think the party probably may have to con well think twice because the electorate will think well look. This is, they may perceive it to be dirty money. And they will say, well, look, dirty money is being used as, to, to, to fund the party or an electoral campaign. So I think it's up to the Conservative Party whether they actually want to keep the money. That's down to them. Edward, but thank I you. I, I'm going I'm to move on to Charlie. Thank you very much, Edward. So, no, so Charlie, obviously, you. you've been listening to all of this. Now, uh, Rishi Sunak said various things along the way as this story unfolded. One was, well, Frank Hester has shown remorse. You know, he's really donated remorse along with the money, so therefore we don't have to give the money back because he's very sorry and he wishes he hadn't said it. Frank Hester eventually did apologise for having said it, although he maintained it had nothing to do with the colour of Diane Abbott's skin or the fact that she was a woman, even though that's precisely what he said, so that's quite difficult to possibly believe. Um, and then Rishi Sunak said, well, you know, it's enough of this already. We've kind of, like, had enough of this conversation. You know, we're keeping the money. Obviously, he's sorry. Let's move on. Nothing to see here. But this story isn't going away, as Edward says, and, and it was being suggested at the beginning that, you know, people wouldn't like it, that the electorate wouldn't like it, that they would remember it, a bit like the Dominic Cummings thing that never went away. Everyone kept remembering it, kept talking about it. Um, and that the electorate will say, well, what's paid for this campaign? Is it dirty money? As, Ed, as Edward rightly says, um, this must be a, co a cause of consternation at number 10, mustn't it? Um, uh, I think it will be. And I think, look, regardless of whether the Tory party gives the money back, um, uh, this is something that the Labour Party or any other political party, for that matter, will want to continue to remind the country of, uh, that this is someone who has donated to the Conservative Party or has been uh, a Conservative supporter. Now, I'm a Conservative supporter. Um, uh, I think those comments were disgusting, deplorable. They absolutely were racist. Yeah. Um, so it's right that there's been an apology. Um, I don't um, personally see how it would uh, benefit um, giving £10 million back to already a multi-millionaire, uh, ultimately rewarding him uh, for making these comments. Uh, I think the money could either, if it's already been spent, then I think you know, the Conservative Party can um, articulate that it accepted that money in good faith. Mm. The comments were made years ago. The Tory party obviously wasn't aware that those comments had been made. So I think it's perfectly legitimate to explain that why they're keeping the money, but they should absolutely disassociate themselves uh, with Mr Hester going forward. Um, and of course, we'll have to wait and hear about the extra £5 million, pounds, whether that's uh, been actually sort of uh, given to the party, because that will be declared in the usual way through the, uh, uh, the, the register of interest that all political parties have to sign up to. Um, but you're right, it goes to a broader point about uh, society and politics and, you know, diversity and culture and what kind of country uh, we want to be in. And I think those comments, um, as I say, were absolutely deplorable and disgusting. They were racist and it was right for Kemi Badenoch and others to then uh, call uh, Mr Hester out for so them. So then you wonder about the judgment call, don't you? You wonder whether it would have been better for the Prime Minister and the party to bite the bullet immediately, for him to say immediately. And, and you might think almost instinctively, oh my God, this is awful. This is a horrible thing to say. Wow. Misogynistic, violent, racist utterly inappropriate, not something with which the Tories want to have any truck whatsoever, mm. and at great personal cost to us in an election year, we're sending back the money. And 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 also, you know, if we're honest about these kind of things, Rishi Sunak and his wife have a combined, you know, income of literally, isn't it, over a billion pounds or something like that of personal wealth. You know, if he needs to drum up 10 million from somewhere, he can surely manage to do it from somewhere else, rather than kind of wade away in the shallows with Frank Hester, where it's looking, as Edward says worse and worse every minute 
Well, uh, the uh, I, you know that that is a, a very valid point, and um, but I think you know uh, the party has to continue to function. It has to field candidates. It has to put training in place. It has to uh, continue to run, and it is obviously scaling up. Every political party is scaling up in the run up to uh, uh, the general election. Of course, we've got local elections uh, coming uh, in just a, uh, yeah. a few weeks' time on the second of May. So. I think you know, the money might have already been spent and therefore it's difficult then to try and um, cook the books in that sense. But I think the Prime Minister wants to be saying to the country, look, I'm the Prime Minister of the UK, I've got you know, a hell of a lot of things going on, I've got so much in my entry. Uh, we have a party, you know, party chairman that could be dealing with party matters, but he's getting on and focused on the job in running the country. Right, Edward, I want to run something else by you. This is Rish... Oh, he's gone. OK, well, then I'll discuss this with Charlie. Rishi Sunak has attacked uh, Keir Starmer for, and I quote, arrogantly taking voters for granted and assuming he can just stroll into number 10. He claimed the Labour leader had no plan for how to run the country uh, at the Tories' local election campaign launch. But you might say that Keir Starmer's so many points ahead, is it 25 points ahead or something, that it's not really arrogance, it's just a kind of factual thing. Well, I think the polls will all naturally narrow as you get close to an election and where you get people. I mean, I think there was a, a report in the Times earlier on about, you know, uh, fake cabinet ministers that have sort of such a bigger profile and such a great relationship with the, you know, yes. the, the, the general public. Yes. Well, they don't exist. Um, so, you know, I think that shows just how perhaps the public aren't switched on enough at the minute because we've had so much politics and I don't blame the public for not wanting to necessarily engage in all the issues that are taking place. But I think as the, when people are forced with that choice and they're forced with the decisions that uh, will be before them when they have to look at the policy platforms that all the political parties are putting forward, uh, then people will switch on and they will see that actually even if you don't like the Conservatives because of the internal party politics, mm. you can look at Labour's policies and judge them for, for what they are. And I think, you know, Sir Keir Starmer in the interview with The Sun just only the other day yes, said that taxes here, here, would go yesterday, up. Yes, yesterday, yes. You know, taxes would increase. Now, do people actually want that? You know, you, people will be faced with that real choice of, OK, there's been a bit of internal party, uh, Conservative Party divisions, but you know, can Rishi Sunak continue to sort of lead the country with inflation coming down and doing the things that he said he's going to do? Do you stick with him or do you really want to change? But you've got to look at the policies, I think, very, very closely and very carefully at all the political parties before uh, you put that cross in, is in it, that Is box. it true, though, that it, it, it will serve Keir Starmer well not to declare his hand in any policies if he can possibly avoid it? Because if he does, he might derail his progress into number 10. And if he just keeps quiet, he, he continues to sail forth. Well, that is a strategy, and um, <coughs> uh, it is a dangerous one because I think the public shouldn't be taken for fools. The closer you get to an election, the public will want to see exactly what they're voting for. They'll want to see uh, uh, whether or not actually Sakir Sama is worth voting for the Labour Party because alternatively you could vote reform that we see uh, going up in the polls. Now, I think people will understand that the choice is going to be very clear at the general election. You're either going to have Sir Keir Starmer as the Prime Minister or Rishi Sunak. So it is a two-horse race in that respect. And after those two horses, uh, who's got the... Um uh, 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 yeah, the better legs, ahead. who's nose ahead and... Uh, Find the mane. Yeah, exactly. And have to carry on with this horse metaphor. <laughs> the greater hoof. Yes. Yes, yeah. the wider girth. I don't know whatever you want to say. <laughs> the, the more burnished saddle, whatever you want to say. The equine <laughs> metaphor you can say on this programme and I'll thoroughly enjoy it. Charlie, thank you very much indeed. Coming up after the break, find out why tens of thousands of young people are avoiding joining the British Army. I'm Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of Cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position. But I think he'd need to say that he got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
May. Might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media, having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minute, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. The British Army is facing a recruitment crisis as tens of thousands of potential soldiers withdraw their applications due to admission delays. Applicants are taking up to six months to go through the recruitment process, with 70% of them pulling out before they get through the doors. The alarming data comes amid mounting concerns surrounding defence numbers, meaning the Army could dip below its largest force of 73,000 personnel within months. Joining us live to discuss this, the journalist who broke the story, the Times Defence Editor Larissa Brown, former head of counterterrorism Major General Chip Chapman, and former British Army commander Major General Tim Cross. Thank you all very much indeed for joining me. Larissa, would you just set out the stall of this story? Because increasingly on this programme, we're talking about you know imminent threats from various foreign powers and a volatile situation in, in, in the world. And 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 you know, whether we need much more serious consideration about our armed forces, investment therein, and recruitment too. So this this is a story that makes people already concerned about this much more concerned than they were before. Yes, absolutely. And we've been given this these astonishing figures uh, from the Labour Party. And they really set out quite, it, you know, it's quite astonishing that we're getting tens of thousands of young people that are showing an interest. They're actually expressing that, that initial interest in joining the armed forces. But then because they're having to wait so long to get through the process, they're giving up. And I was speaking to Grant Shapps, the Defence Secretary, last week, and he was saying that the Amazon generation is how he described it. You know, people, the youngsters that get things instantly, don't want to have to wait that long to join the armed forces. And he actually said himself that the whole recruitment process was ludicrous. And then now we've actually been given these figures which show that tens of thousands of people have applied last year and then gave up during the process. It's just quite, quite amazing data, really. Um, and for me, who's written a lot of stories about the recruitment crisis and about how the army's so short of people and the navy is and the ref to then find out that actually they are getting that interest but then they're actually not being able to deal with the applications quick enough is just really interesting so what it well interesting is one way of describing it interesting but i think people will think it absolutely appalling but why is it taking so long is the key question if young people are keen enough to bother to apply why is it taking so long to process the applications and why so long to make decisions well, I'm told one of the key reasons is uh, the, the medical process. So they've got to involve doctors in a lot of cases. If people have got something uh, wrong with them and they've got to get a second opinion. Um, the, the military does um, not allow quite a lot of people for, for quite um, what, what people might assume quite trivial, small things. 
Um, for example, if they've got um, a parent that has got some sort of um, health issue, then that can be taken into account. Uh, also, uh, even things like tattoos, they need to look at, they sometimes do uh, big assessments on uh, the nature of tattoos and where they are, um, and uh, uh, other, other things such as asthma. So I think all of that can take quite a while. And then uh, it's a bit unclear, really. I asked the army about it and they didn't really have any answers. In fact, actually, they were saying that they thought uh, to wait an average of 5.3 months isn't really that bad. Um, and and they think that, that, that they're getting better at it. Gosh, let me, let me bring Major General Chip Chapman into, into this. Um, are you surprised by this? Is this something that you think is horrifying or is this fairly routine? I'm not surprised by it. I'm horrified by it. Uh -huh. Um, the, the problem is um, someone like the Earl of Minto, who's the defence rep in the House of Lords, recently told us that there were 10,000 applications to join the British Army in January. Mm. That's an irrelevant metric if you can't get them into the input, basic training starts, and then the output, a trained soldier, sailor or airman. And what we've really found here is that um, we've actually got Generation Gen Z We've captured their interest. They yeah. want to join the army. We've then lost them because uh, we talk about Gen Z of having an eight second filter. If they're not engaged in the process after they've had that interest, they'll move on. And it's that agility, which we're not seeing in the recruitment process. And like everything in the army or armed forces, agility has a doctrinal definition. It's flexibility, adaptability yeah. and responsiveness. And the armed forces are failing on all those accounts in terms of the recruiting process. But do you have any idea what is required that takes so long? Because you think, you know, before you have, let's say, a major operation, you know, you fill in the form. Have you got this ailment, this complaint? Have you got a pacemaker? Have you got this, that and the other? And you put yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And then you either do or don't have the operation. The date is right there. You filled in the form. What are the sorts of things that take so much investigation and in such a prolonged manner? Why is it not possible to see the young person, see what they what, what, what they offer and decide yes no yes you're in no you're not well the recruitment ch the choke points as larissa said are partly to do with medical and one of the things which has occurred really in the last 30 or 40 years is absolute risk aversion because um, the ministry of defense can now be sued mm. so it might have been more agile 40 years ago it isn't so now and an example of that is larissa for example mentioned about tattoos uh, the, if you've got tattoos on your hands now or mm. above the neck, you know, behind your ear, that has to go to a military judgment panel. We've not de decentralised decision making at the lowest level to people to make these decisions. So all this thing, all these things are compounding things. The other thing is that the medical side, there is not, it's not digitised. There is no digitised medical process. And the figures are also probably skewed by those wanting to join from Commonwealth countries for which the processes are almost naturally going to take longer, but shouldn't in the digital age. So catching up from an analog system of paper, really what you kind of alluded to in a way, Vanessa, to a digital age means that we should be more agile in doing doing these things, and we're currently not. I mean, this really is a horrifying story. Um, let me bring uh, Commander um, Major General Tim Cross into, into this conversation, because many times in the last few months on this show, I've spoken to uh, uh, lieutenant colonels and to commanders and to all sorts of people, all saying what we need, you know, army recruitment must be up. We have to make it seem like an enticing and stimulating and very valuable and, and, and incredibly responsible, interesting career. It's very, very important. And now we hear that, that recruitment is being hindered and hampered by, you know, writing notes in a fountain pen or on a piece of parchment and tattoos being individually carefully examined by a large committee that has to decide if they're going to be a, a danger or not. What do you make of this? Well, I have to tell you, this is not a new story. This has been going on for years. Uh -huh. um, when I joined up and I spoke, Chip did the same thing. You went to a recruiting office, you spoke to people, they looked at you, you tatted, you filled in forms and so forth. Yeah. A number of years ago, I was the Army Advisor to the House of Commons Defence Committee for seven years back in the uh, about, 20, uh, about 2010, something like that, for about seven years. Um, and they, we, the MOD, the outsourced the recruiting process to a private company called Capita. And they said, we are going to save you an awful lot of money by putting this whole thing online. People will get online, they'll fill in the forms, and everything will be, we can close all these recruiting offices, we can get rid of all those people manning those recruiting offices, and it will be fine. 
it ran into trouble very quickly, and uh, it was a number. It, there were a number of inquiries actually within the Defence Committee, and I personally met the head of Capita at one point to talk to him about the fact that this just wasn't working, and that was partly because my own grandson went through this problem. He waited about I can't remember now ten, twelve months, Gosh. and in the end gave and went 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 and worked somewhere else. In fact, he's just been through the recruiting process for BAE Systems, and it was very slick, very fast, and he had an interview with people face to face. Um, now, the problem here is that part of it, and you, you've referred to it already, is the medical piece, and Chip was talking about this. When you fill in these forms online, if you tick the wrong box, very quickly you can be filtered out. And if you tick a box that says, I had asthma as a child, or you know, my, in my grandson's case, actually, he'd fallen off a train and had a brain injury, um, then the whole thing just grinds to a halt, and uh, you, do, you do need to see a medic. Um, so... It's, it's, I just think the system is broken. I mean, I've been saying this for years. I think we need to get rid of capita. I think we need to go back to recruiting properly. And, and we're in a downward spiral here. The message that's going out is this thing is not working. Therefore, people won't apply. We're not taking enough people in. And we're going to fall well below mm -hmm. the very small, small figure, in my view, far too small figure of an army of about 70,000. I mean, it is absolutely ludicrous, isn't it, when you say if there's any kind of blip or anomaly, childhood asthma, whatever else it is, it all just falls apart completely. You just have to wait months and months for some medic to actually look at the person. Why should it take months? There are doctors everywhere. Doctors can be paid privately if they need to be accessed uh, over a weekend or something. It can't be beyond the wit of man or beast to well, just hook them up immediately and get a yes or a no, can it? Well, it's, it's not going to happen overnight, obviously. But and, and we need to be, one sense, we need to be a bit careful because as Chip again has already referred to, you can't afford to take people in who medically unfit put them through a training program and then they end up in trouble because the MOD itself will be in trouble. So you, you've got to, you know, you've got to have a process for this and finding medics, doctors and so forth to do these examinations. Oh, we all know the state of the NHS and, and so on. So I, I don't want to outly condemn the fact that we do need to put people through a proper medical system and ensure that they are fit enough to join the military. The whole business of tattoos and other things, too, that used to be, you know, you couldn't join if you had a tattoo. Uh, you know, not that long ago. But all of those things need, need to be filtered through. But the bottom line is it just, just it takes too much time. I, I don't know where the, uh, you know, how, how we can or how they, the MOD, can resolve this. But part of it is somebody has to grip this organisation and get to grips with it and sort it out. Because this is, as I said earlier, I started off with, this is not a new problem. This has been going on for years. Thank you all very much indeed. People will be absolutely flabbergasted. People who are not familiar with the fact that it's been going on for years will be, Larissa, astounded, I think, and horrified by your story. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate it. Coming up after the break, the Prime Minister criticises Nike's decision to change the colour of the St George's Cross on the new England football shirt. I'm Vanessa Feltz. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. The backlash around the design of the New England football shirt continues to kick on after designers Nike changed the colour of the St George's Cross. Fans and former players have criticised the move and a petition to change the colours back to the traditional red has over 25,000 signatures. Even politicians have entered the field with Rishi Sunak saying the flag should not be messed with and Keir Starmer, while appearing on The Sun's brand new political show Never Mind the Ballots, saying it doesn't need to be changed. Um, and the flag is used by everybody. It is a unified, it doesn't need to be changed. We just need to be proud of it. So I think they should just reconsider this and change it back. All right. I'm not even sure they can properly explain, explain why no, no. they thought they needed to change in the first place. Nike have defended the design, saying it's a nod to the 1966 training kit, while the FA say they have no intention of recalling it. So have they scored an own goal here or not? Joining me on the programme, the journalist Daniel Harris and lifelong season ticket holder Peter Blexley. Good to have you both on the show. Let's kick off with you, Daniel. I mean, it's actually an incredibly small little St George's Cross on the back of the collar of the shirt. You can see that's pretty much to scale. It's a tiny little thing, but it's certainly not red. Does that matter? Uh, not to me, it doesn't. I mean, it kind of fits that little England mentality. I, I, I cannot fathom for the life of me what it is that would make, that would exercise people about this. There are wars going on. There are people in this country that don't have enough food to eat. There are people that can't, can't clothe their kids, that can't heat their homes. How on earth has anyone got the emotional energy to invest in this thing that has even happened before. The Peter Savilingdon shirt that they did in 2010 did something similar. Um, they've done it with the Scottish saltire and rugby shirts. Um, and, so, um, and they've done it with, sorry, not rugby shirt, the 2007 Scotland kit. They did it with the Team GB 2012 Olympics kit. So this is not an unprecedented thing. And I think we need to be very careful about people make, using this. The people that are making a fuss about this have political reasons for so doing. Because you have Keir Starmer, right, who every vote counts as far as he's concerned. Even, even idiots and bigots can vote. So if people who are really bothered about this somehow infringing their sense of bitterness, of, sorry, Britishness, that's Freudian, wasn't it? But people, <laughs> if it inf inf infringes people's sense of Britishness, then he wants those people to vote for him. I, I would be amazed if Keir Starmer actually cared about this himself. He was just appearing on the Sun podcast. He's talking to his audience and he said what he thought they wanted to hear because that is generally how Keir Starmer does politics. And in a sense, I mean, I guess it's working for him. So I understand why he did that. And then if you look at the other people who are making sport out of it, you're talking about Lee Anderson. You're talking about Nigel Farage and their whole political raison d'etre is about inspiring this kind of division. It's about getting people agitated and exercised about these small symbolic things. They don't have any big policy ideas or they don't have any ideas about how they're going to help people eat better, how they're going to help people live better. But these are the things, and without those things, these guys don't have any political currency whatsoever. So, of course, they want to prolong this kind of aggravation. So I'm not sure, Peter Blexley, whether Daniel's calling you an idiot and a bigot for caring about this. I surmise that he might be. Well, I've been insulted by professionals in the past, so that certainly wouldn't bother me. And I've got unbounded energy to spend on this subject. And, of course, I'm not a politician. 
this this tampering with the flag of the English flag is a sacrilegious disrespecting of the national flag of England. And as such, these shirts should be pulled, cancelled, and a new shirt should be issued, which honours, respects the tradition of the flag of St George and England. I mean, you could say that rather than an own goal, Peter, Nike have absolutely played a blinder because this is mildly controversial. Some people are exercised and upset, aerated about it. It's got an enormous amount of airtime. I was talking about it on this morning on ITV this morning. I'm talking about it on my show again today. I'm sure you've probably been speaking about it elsewhere. I mean, if you're selling football shirts, this is surely the way to do it. And that is what they are. They're in the garment business. They're not politicos. They're just trying to flog the shirts, aren't they? Anybody who has 120 pounds, yes, 120 pounds to waste on this disrespectful rag clearly has more money than sense. We have to remember Nike, the company that have played around in advertising campaigns with Dylan Mulvaney and the like. And of course, what Nike have done and exploited is that sadly, the UK in many regards has become woke city of the universe. So they thought they could get away with this. Well, the backlash is very well placed. It's gone across the political spectrum. It's absolutely right. And I hope that these shirts sit on hangers, rot, need to be recycled, and that Nike can issue a shirt that proud English, but <laughs> excuse me, can be proud of. Let me bring Daniel back into this. You see, Daniel, Peter isn't a, a, a politician. He's got no political point to make and there's no reason to score any political points either. But you can see he does mind about this. I, don't think, I think you'll agree he's, he's not an idiot nor a bigot. He's a, a thoroughly decent former police person, isn't he? Uh, I, I've never met him. Uh, I hope so. I hope not. Um, but, I, I, yeah, I, I think the point, though, is Peter's not really been actually specific about what it is that's bothering him. He said it's disrespectful, but why? Let's ask him. Peter, why is it disrespectful? Be specific, please. I've been perfectly clear as to why it's disrespectful. It's tampering, in fact, disrespecting the national colours and structure of the flag of England. Imagine if Nike tried to pull a stunt like this with the stars and stripes of America or the national flags of China, Iran, Russia or maybe many Arab, Arab countries, for example, there would be outrage and probably bloodshed. Daniel. Why, but why, why is that? So if there would be bloodshed, in like you're talking about Russia, China, totalitarian regimes, and they would react in this obscene, absurd way, the fact that they would do it doesn't mean that we should do it. We, we should be temperate and sensible and understand that what really matters is not what colour this little cross is. It doesn't affect anyone in any kind of material way. Does it hurt you? No. Does it cause you suffering? No. Does it cause you pain? No. Does it take money away from you? No. So in actual fact, it's, 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 it's a symbolic thing. And as adults, it feels like we should be in a position to say, I can understand what the flag does or doesn't represent. And a marketing thing to get people to buy it or to get people talking about it is something that we're familiar with in all sorts of ways. The flag is, it, it's not, it doesn't have this sacred status. And this is something that's very peculiar about America where they kind of do ascribe this sacred status to the flag. For what? Why, why would you do that? And there's nothing, the fact that they do it in these other countries, the fact that they might be totalitarian in China and take this flag very seriously, surely we would look at that and say, why would we want to be like that? I'm going to, give Peter, the, I'm going to give Peter the last word, Daniel. Thank you very much, so he can respond to that. Well, it was very interesting that Daniel posed a number of questions and then had the effrontery to answer them as if it was me answering them. A flag is a national symbol. Many, many people, including my relatives, lived and died for this flag in proud service of their nation. Certain things are sacros sacrosanct, and the national flag of a country is exactly that. All right, I'm going to leave it there, gentlemen. Thank you both very much indeed. And now a question for you. Would you bring your baby on a hen -do? Would you be OK if your friend wanted to bring their baby along? We will be discussing that story after the break. I'm Vanessa Feltz, and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and on your smart speaker.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho, so <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Do you think it's socially acceptable to bring a baby on a hen do? One mum's come under fire recently for revealing she brought her husband, an eight-month-old, to Mallorca for a friend's hen party. 30-year-old Elizabeth Canina was pregnant when the trip to Spain was booked, but when the time came to leave her little girl at home, she didn't feel she could go through with it. So the bride agreed that her husband and the baby could join the girl's trip. Joining us live is journalist Chloe Hamilton, who has a toddler herself. Hello, Chloe, good to have you on. What do you think about taking a baby out? And a husband on a hen do. Hello, um, I, I think it's absolutely fine. I actually think it's a really lovely example of a couple working together as a team um, in looking after their baby and also ensuring that the mum gets to have some time with her friends. So I think it's absolutely fine. I think it's a fantastic idea. I really love it. And also, I think it's so great that the bride was so um, understanding as well. I think we hear so many stories these days about kind of bridezillas not letting their friends bring babies to weddings or or hen parties. And I think that, that she realised that, you know, what her friend needed was to bring her baby. I think that was a really lovely thing to do, especially as the mum in question was breastfeeding. Like, she had to bring her baby. She couldn't leave her. Or, uh, yeah, she couldn't leave the baby. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's a really positive thing. I, I don't do think it. there are just some things from which you are excluded at some points in your life. You know, nobody gets to go to every party all the time, all the way through their life. And maybe the whole point of a hen do is to shrug off the, the responsibilities of children and husbands and husbands-to-be and have an all-girls 
fun time where you can really let your hair down. And if you start carting along babies and husbands, it kind of detracts <laughs> from that exclusive let your hair down atmosphere. And it is possible, isn't it, for, for, for a good friend of the bride to forego just one hen do to stay at home and breastfeed if that's what she most wants to do and let everybody else get on with it without tagging the baby and the husband along. Yeah, possibly. Although it sounds like um, she didn't want to forego it and she didn't have to forego it because her husband was obviously more than willing to take the baby along and look after the baby. I mean, I think like all credit to him as well um, for doing that. I mean, you know, that's, that's kind of lovely. That's a really nice thing to do. Um, and it, yeah, yes, I get that sometimes there are some things that we miss out on as parents. But if you don't have to miss out on them, if there's another solution, then why shouldn't we embrace those um, and welcome, you know, welcome everyone along? And it doesn't sound like the baby came along to any of the actual events. So I think this is a really um, great solution. And it's something that I would definitely do. And I know that my partner would also be very supportive of, of as well. I breastfed my son until he was about 18 months old. So we would have found ourselves in a very similar situation. I wouldn't have wanted to miss out on all of these events for 18 months, but also I wasn't ready to stop breastfeeding. So if a solution can be found to avoid that, like this couple found and this friend, then I think that's great. You don't think it kind of puts a different atmosphere on the event that, you know, somebody's going to have to go and feed the breastfeed the baby in the hotel up the road, somebody's husband's pacing the floor outside with the baby, a crying baby in the buggy waiting for the mother to come out of the hen do and breastfeed the crying baby and everybody else is just trying to forget there are any husbands or babies but can't because one of the party keeps decamping to go and breastfeed the baby that's in the hotel up the road. It's kind of not... It, 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 it's the opposite of concentrating the mind, isn't it? It's kind of diluting the atmosphere somewhat. Yeah. I think that's kind of on them. I think that's not really any of their issues. If it's someone's choice, that's what they want to do, then I think that's fine. And obviously, you know, the, the most important person, well, at, at the hen party, typically the most important person is the bride. If the bride's happy with it, and it sounds like she was, she really wanted her friend there, then I think, you know, go for your life. I think that sounds great. Um, but yeah, I mean, I maybe can understand that it might be a little bit frustrating to have someone nipping out all the time. Um, but that's on them. That's not on you. That's I, not really going to impact are you, your experience that, of the event. Are you surprised that this story has run and run? Because this has been a big story today. It's been talked about everywhere. I, I think people have gone mad. I think this is insane. I think it's such, I genuinely think it's a lovely story of, some, of, of people like being supportive and helping each other out. Um, especially like we hear so many awful stories about you know brides gone mad and you know disinviting their friends because they want to bring their children or their, their you know their babies along to weddings um, and friends like friendships falling out i think this is a really positive story to be celebrated um about you know people just working together and making things work for themselves Chloe, thank you very much. Good to have you on the programme and love to the baby. No. Coming up after the break, the Home Secretary spent over £165,000 chartering a private jet for a one-day round trip to Rwanda. I'm Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know, uh, it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Very good afternoon to you and welcome back to the show. I'm Vanessa Feltz. Here's what's coming up this hour. The true cost of the Rwanda plan. James cleverly spent over £165,000 charging a private jet for a one-day round trip to Kigali to sign a deal on the government's failing scheme. Plus, Britain's benefits bill. The cost of sickness benefits will surge by more than a third by the end of the decade as the worklessness crisis deepens. And the royal security breach. The Princess of Wales's private medical records were easily available to staff at the London Clinic, where she was being treated. First of all, though, let's have the news headlines with Nadira Tudor. Good afternoon. West Yorkshire police are investigating alleged racist comments made by a Conservative Party donor about Diane Abbott. Businessman Frank Hester is accused of saying in 2019 that the Labour MP should be shot. He has apologised but insisted his remarks had nothing to do with gender or skin colour. Broadcaster and writer Edward Adu told Vanessa the way the Tories have dealt with it feels like an attack. If those actions can be more or less endorsed or, more, or swept under the carpet where we've been told uh, continuously we need to move on, that will certainly spark or it will be inflammatory to not just the, the black community, but to, to other faiths and, and, and races in the UK. The Football Association has defended the St George's Cross design on the New England kit, saying it's not the first time different colours have been used. The blues and purples have caused huge uproar. The PM said Nike shouldn't mess with our national flags and Sir Keir Starmer has even called for the official Euro kit to be recalled. Nike says it was never its intention to offend. The UN Security Council has rejected calls by the US for a ceasefire in Gaza with China and Russia voting against it. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken has been in Israel to push for it. It follows a joint statement from the UK and Australia warning of the potentially devastating consequences of a ground offensive in southern Gaza. The family of a British woman who has been missing for three years in the US Virgin Islands are pleading for help from President Biden to find her. Sam Heslop disappeared from a catamaran of her then boyfriend Ryan Bain in March 2021. Her friend Andrew Baldwin told Talk TV they're still trying to piece together what has happened. Three years ago on the 8th of March, uh, Sam went missing uh, in the Caribbean. She was uh, living on a yacht and working on a yacht of her boyfriend, uh, Ryan Bain. Uh, and at 2 a.m. in the morning, uh, she allegedly went missing. Uh, Mr. Bain uh, reported it to the police that she had gone missing and then um, failed to report it to the Coast Guard for nine hours, uh, allegedly inferring that Sam had fallen off of the boat. The man who murdered a couple with the opioid fentanyl has been jailed for life. Luke DeWitt, who worked for Stephen and Carol Baxter, poisoned them with the painkiller and rewrote their will to leave their business to him. DeWitt will serve at least 37 years behind bars.
And a recent study has found puberty is responsible for making teenagers' armpits smell like cheese, goat and even urine. Scientists have singled out the chemical compounds that cause the bad odours. It's hoped that the discovery could lead to the development of more effective and targeted deodorants. Those are the headlines. Now here's Joe Wheeler with the weather. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, it's turning quite a bit colder over the weekend. Or should I say it will feel colder? Temperatures actually will be close to average for the time of year. We've just been spoilt over the last few days. And it's all down to this area of cloud and rain, which is clearing southern parts, and that's dragging in the cold air. Now, that cold air is already over Scotland, and here we've got showers, some of these turning wintry up over the higher ground, and they're also blown in on a strong to gale force winds. In fact, it'll become more breezy right across the country. So those showers focused on the north west but some of them pushing their way inland and those continue overnight now temperatures are low enough for a touch of frost but you need to be very well sheltered from the wind to actually experience a frost and then through the course of saturday showers from the often becoming widespread through the course of the day winterness extending down to the pennines also to parts of north wales temperatures in single figures for most eight or nine down in the south but with those stronger winds it'll feel more like four or five degrees celsius now all of this is courtesy of this area of low pressure which does actually start to move away at the end of the weekend things quieten down for a short time but low pressure returns next week and further unsettled weather times radio sponsors talk tv weather Many thanks to Nadira and to Joe. Let's move directly to our top story. The Home Secretary spent over £165,000 charging a private jet for a one-day round trip to Rwanda to sign the deal for the government's failing deportation plan. The trip took place back in December, but a document's today been released revealing that James Cleverly travelled to Kigali with Home Office officials and even a TV crew. This is on top of the hundreds of millions of pounds worth of taxpayers' money that's already gone towards trying to get the scheme to send asylum seekers to Rwanda up and running. And just this week, that scheme suffered the latest blow in Parliament when the House of Lords defeated the government on seven separate votes. So is this all a huge waste of time and an immense waste of money? Joining me in the studio to discuss this, Scarlett Maguire from JL Park Polls and Richard Passaid, a former Labour official. Good to have you both here again. Nice to see you. I mean, let's start with you, Scarlett, because your, your whole job and your raison d'etre is to take the temperature of public opinion. So what do people think of this stuff? So shall we start with this news, today's news, the breaking news, that... The Home Secretary, James Kevy, spent £165,000 of our money schlepping all the way to Kigali on a private jet in a one-day round trip as if it was urgent, as if everybody was desperately waiting for this, whatever it is, agreement to be signed as a matter of such urgency that he couldn't even just fly on a normal flight, spend a night in a hotel in Kigali and come back again. It all had to be done with extreme urgency and with a TV crew there to record the historic moment, even though no one's gone, no one looks likely to go there, and it's cost a whole hell of a lot of money so far. Yeah, I think it's just the latest sort of slightly farcical incident in the whole long-running saga of the Rwanda bill. And I think this is exactly the problem with it, even though um, the public do actually, uh, on the whole, support the idea of detention to safe countries for people who come here illegally. Uh, the Rwanda scheme has been around for too long for not working. It's sort of been a shambles from start to finish. I think the fact that even, you know, they couldn't even get it through before Easter. At one point, we thought it was going to come before Christmas. They were, big, you know, talking up emergency legislation. It's just another thing that this government uh, talks a lot about doing and then doesn't do anything about. And I think that uh, is just going to make things worse for the public. And, and, and Richard, you know, this idea of this chartering with the, the private plane, getting these people on board, you know, officials and a camera crew to record the vote, and then flying off there in this tremendous impetus of speed and urgency and then flying back again. What, what, is, what is propelling that? Is that James Cleverley's distorted view of his own importance? Is it a governmental distorted view of this 
urgent scheme that isn't actually starting at all and is in fact dead in the water rather than urgent? Or is it is it a complete failure to read the fact that we're in a an economic crisis, people are financially really up against it, and the idea of a private plane costing 165 thousand pounds is absolutely abhorrent to virtually everybody in the entire country i'm sure well perhaps just all of the above all of the above of Vanessa, but uh i think it's proof positive of what a lot of people have been saying for a while which is that the whole thing's a big gimmick mm -hmm. you know uh, the entire political class knows perfectly well and should be much more frank and honest with the public about the fact that the causes of many millions of people needing to leave where they are and go somewhere safer and better and wanting to make better lives mm. are not going away. The desperation of these people is not going away. Trying to kill them, as the, you know, the, the Greek uh, Coast Guard has repeatedly done when they've allowed um, boats to drown and when they've pushed boats away back into dangerous waters, even though they knew children were on those boats. Trying to kill them isn't stopping people from coming. That's how bad their lives are and how desperate they are to get somewhere where maybe they know somebody, maybe they think they can get a job somewhere, maybe they speak the language. Those things aren't going away. So we need to come up with a new solution. I would suggest that, you know, maybe we should stop thinking so much about how to, uh, you know, avoid putting taxes on the super rich and instead use some taxes on the super rich to improve our welfare state. Can't so, use taxes so, on the so, super so, rich, Richard, to fund everything. Let me think. People talk about, no, let I will finish, let you finish, finish, but this, I have to interrupt that because this is an inane economic <laughs> policy. Not only inane, but insane. And I know the difference between the two. It's actually ridiculous to assume that tax on the super rich, however many there are in this country, and it's an infinitesimal num number and a tiny percentage of the total population, can fund absolutely every single thing that Labour is going to un undertake to fund. Which is absolutely giving, you know, this isn't a Labour policy. But, no, I'm but not demand, but demand, Labour but demands for the NHS, demands to fill up potholes, demands to reinvigorate the army, demands to, you know, uh, uh, absolutely reinforce our defences, demands for all the things that we need to do, schools and hospitals and everything else all on the back of this tiny percentage of mega rich who are somehow going to uh, cough up in taxes. If they're that rich, they're not paying that kind of tax anywhere in the world. They're offshore somewhere, avoiding tax and evading tax absolutely everywhere. So that, you know, the, the, new, the new policy on non-doms is going to mean they won't be here in the blink in first place. But the idea that that can fund um, some kind of happy life for people who would be migrants to this country, that has not to work. Let's bring Scar Scarlett into talk. <laughs> you about... said that you were going to let me respond, No, I'm not. Vanessa. I'm not. I'm what the hell. It's a Friday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> no, I've, I've run out of patience. Let's go to let's go to Scarlett instead to talk about Richard's idea that you know that the focus on migrants and the focus on keeping them away and keeping them out and not wanting them to come in and how do we get rid of them and how do we exclude them is something that is a kind of political stance. It's a kind of symbol, but nobody really thinks we can actually do it. How much do people in this country, the normal voters and population, want that to happen? How much are they concerned about it? I think voters are very concerned. And if if you look at their sort of top three concerns, generally speaking, it does tend to be uh, the economy, the NHS and the health service and immigration. I think when you go around the country doing focus groups, people are despairing at the state of public services. I think that above and beyond everything else, but very much immigration as well. And that's actually something you're hearing increasingly. Uh, now, some people say that's because uh, it's been in the headlines a lot. No thanks, uh, no small thanks you know, to the Rwanda scheme and things like yes. it. Uh, I'm not sure that's entirely it as well. I think uh, that there, there is really quite deep concern. But I think the problem is uh, the government have been doing the worst of both worlds, which is talking about it an awful lot and not doing anything. And I think that's going to make people very cross. And it has been making their voters who care especially about it. So immigration is the number one concern of those who voted Conservative in 2019. Mm -hmm. It will be, uh, you know, part of the reason why large numbers are now going to reform. It's going to be alienating them. All right, now over to you, Richard. Sorry. Over to you, my darling. So, so your chance to, to counter this, because Scarlett says this is very real in the hearts and minds of huge swathes of our population are very concerned and not particularly worried about whether there's climate change which is driving people here or whether it's war that's driving people here or whether they just want to make good and have a better life. They don't really mind that much why. They just don't very much want them to come. I'm not saying it's not a real concern. I'm saying that it's a concern which is produced through at least three decades, if not more, of the political class not telling the truth to the people of this country about why this is happening and how we can possibly respond to it. Look, this country takes roughly its fair share 
of asylum seekers. You know, most countries who are in between us and the places that asylum seekers are coming from are taking more, a much higher proportion. We have a duty as a wealthy country. We benefit from being enriched by diversity. And fundamentally, there is a huge gap in this country between the super rich and everyone else. Mm -hmm. We tax those people far less than many of uh, comparable countries do. You said, you know, oh, it's totally impossible. I'm kind of sick, Vanessa. They, of can't, people. they can't fund I everything. Sick. I am sick of people saying that this country can't be as good and as fair as the countries next door to us at doing things like taxing the super rich. You're right, it's a tiny number of people. It's a tiny number of people with an enormous amount of money. But, but should, they will be frightened away they're, if they're not already frightened away. And if they're not already frightened away, they will be squirrelling money away in intraceable and untraceable trust funds and offshore kind of outlets where we can't get hold of it. Anyway, I just want to ask Scarlett, is there great public sympathy and support for this idea of squeezing the super rich until they're pipsqueak? And is there a feeling that there's enough money, if you do it, to fund absolutely everything that needs to be funded for an entire nation of 65 plus million people? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question because you sort of hit on both the points. So there's always going to be, I think, support for taxing uh, people richer than the people you are asking. Yes. Most people always say they don't mind. Yeah, yeah, they say they like tax rises, but if it's on higher earners than them. Yes. Uh, and especially, that's the, especially the case of the super rich. It's quite hard. I mean, some people, you know, a, a very small minority oppose it on principle, but for the most part, people say, yes, please, can we get more money from those, like, you know, billionaires that are hiding in the country? Mm -hmm. That's very fine. But I think your second point really stands, which is that um, there's not much belief, there's not much faith that that will do much. I think this is part of the problem that Labour has had actually with its economic plans over the last year. I know you're not outlining a Labour policy there, mm -hmm. but with um, some of the things that, you know, all the things they were saying they were going to fund with the non-DOM status, for example, which is a popular policy, obviously so popular the Conservatives have now nicked it. Yes. Um, but uh, the public don't quite believe that's going to fix the sort of quite deep-rooted problems in the country. And, do and you believe, right. Do you believe it is? But, it isn't, is it? Uh, absolutely not. No. I mean, Ra Rachel Reeves very clearly has said the solution to the problems of this country are not just throwing money at it. That's true. There's many other problems which aren't just to do with the amount that you're investing, mm -hmm. but the amount that we're investing is a really key part of it. I would point you to a survey um, of business leaders in the Financial Times a couple of weeks ago, not the most left-wing uh, newspaper and not the most left-wing group of people to survey, saying that they, did, they didn't want taxes to go down. That wasn't what they were asking for. What they wanted was public investment. They said that is the thing that will get growth going. That is the thing that businesses want. And you know what? It's what trade unions are asking for as well. And how do you well. procure public investment, would you say? How do you ensure it? How do you make it happen? Well, look, the fact is that it's more expensive for the government to borrow now, so we can't do as much of it as we should have been doing over the last few decades. But as long as you are investing that in, for instance, capital infrastructure, in things which are making people, uh, which are creating jobs, mm -hmm. then you're always going to get a return on that investment. It's always worth doing. And because the fact is, even now, it's relatively cheap for the government to get And I have got a personal question for you, Richard. Please. And I have got plenty of time for you to answer it. You know Fiona Wilson? Oh, yes. What do you reckon to Fiona Wilson? Oh, you know, she's just my absolute favourite of the of the Labour front bench. You know, Secretary of State for widgets, um, so charismatic, fantastic on broadcast, um, always really, really across her her policy brief. And Scholar, are you an enthusiast? Do you love uh, Fiona Wilson? Yeah, no, exactly. I know, exa I know exactly uh, what's going on. Um, but no, it was, I think it's quite an interesting example. So you're talking about the sort of fictional Labour MP that was polled alongside all the others, and then uh, I think over half people said, oh, yes, we've heard. Of her, we like her very much. Yeah, let me just make this very clear what we're talking about. Fiona Wilson does not exist, but when asked in a poll, what did people think of Fiona Wilson? Were they familiar with her? Did they like the cut of her jib? Did they like her clothes? Did they like her policies? How was it? Was it 40% of people said? I think they, it might be over 50, but it was a lot, 50 an awful lot. Of people. Yeah. 47% of people said they were big fans of Fiona's. They thought, they thought she was terrific. She was one of the highest profile people in the Labour Party and they really couldn't wait to invite her for dinner. She was on their and most wanted list. And them. a whole lot of other stuff. This is somebody who doesn't exist. Yes. And this obviously Scarlett is our pollster here. Yes. What does that show us if people are saying we love Fiona Wilson and there's no such person? I mean, I, I think what it shows you is that, uh, you know, the, the sort of... Um, Westminster sort of village and, and the media surrounding it, uh, of which you know we're, we're all talking about now, but it, it plays a role. But it, I think it vastly overestimates how interested the rest of the country is in individual um, politicians and mm -hmm. policies. Uh, most things have very low cut through with the public. Most public figures have low cut through. I don't actually necessarily think that's a bad thing. Uh, people have got plenty to be getting on with in their everyday lives. People tend to pay attention when they think it matters. So, for example, on an election campaign, people start switching on a lot more, start scrutinising things. I do think it tells you a little bit. About 
about uh, politicians in 2024, though. Just need to remember 2024 for a second. Yeah, in 2024, which is that there is this general sense, and there's something you hear in focus groups quite a lot, that there's no one that impressive around. And people are looking at both sides and thinking, I just don't know. There's no one that I'm getting excited to see. There's no one that's really stood out to me. Uh, I don't really know who any of them are. And I think this is actually indicative of that as well. So they hear someone they think they should have heard of, and they're fine. <laughs> yeah, Wilson, great. love, um, yeah. love, lovely girl, yeah, lovely, brilliant. terrific. I mean, th this is obviously hilarious, but also absolutely terrifying, isn't it? So I don't want to upset the the pollster who we have um, with us, <laughs> but I midst, rather so. love the idea of people, <laughs> uh, you know, fibbing to pollsters. It yeah. does amuse me. I mean, they 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 fib to the rest of us, so why not? You know what? Um, before 1997, before 2010, when David Cameron came in, before 97, when Tony Blair came in, um, you would have said exactly the same thing about the incoming, hypothetically incoming, we don't know that Labour's going to win this election, mm -hmm. um, incoming front benches. The last time, actually, that you had um, uh, a, a front bench coming in who were as experienced as, you know, Yvette Cooper, David Lammy, Rachel Reeves, Keir Starmer, Ed Miliband. Our last time that was 1979, mm -hmm. when Thatcher came in um, with, you know, Willie Whitelaw and people like that behind her. And of course, they'd only been out of power for five years, a bit less. So, um, you know, I think you look at people like Yvette, David Lammy, Ed Miliband, Keir Reeves, they've all got really, really good experience and they all hit the ground running. And the fact that people don't necessarily know their names right now isn't really I'm a problem. I'm just checking, Scarlett, that it doesn't just absolutely sound the death knell in people's hearts. Here words like Yvette Cooper churned up after all this time. Ed Miliband, you're just like, oh, for goodness sake. And isn't there anyone else? And is it them all over again? And just this kind of dire, plangent bell just clanging away. And you're just <laughs> thinking, oh, God, is this the best they can serve up? Or are people thinking, oh, yes, lovely Ed Miliband. Great, terrific. I think it, it's kind of neither. People aren't, I, people, I've not heard someone get fussed about Yvette Cooper either way, mm. any, you know, any time recently in focus groups at any rate. Actually, that's more of a problem that the Conservative Party have had, especially when they do reshuffles and stuff. And we've done focus groups after that, people are going, goodness, it's just the same old people. They're cycling around again and again and again and again. That's just an example of how the Conservative Party have run out of steam. So it's, it seems to apply more to them. Yeah. Um, no, but no, either no, way... Just, just read a bit, bit, bit about this this uh, this um, this poll about Fiona Wilson, who, let me just remind you, lovely listener and delightful viewer, does not exist. So uh, polling reveals months away from the general election. Only half a dozen of the people who could form the next government have significant name recognition. So people don't know uh, Thangam Debonair, the Shadow Culture Secretary, uh, people don't know Nick Thomas Simons or Simmons, the shadow cabinet office minister. Um, so when they said Fiona Wilson, people thought, oh, yes, I know her. Charming girl, doesn't exist at all, has been made up. 15% of people declare themselves favourable towards her, higher than some of the party's most prominent media performers, including Bridget Phillipson, the shadow education secretary, Jonathan Reynolds, the shadow business secretary, and Pat McFadden, the national campaign coordinator. But is that because they're all so damn shadowy, all those shadow ministers? They're, they are shadowy, aren't they? Isn't that why no one knows what they think about them? Because they, they can't even picture them. I mean, they did choose as the photo of Fiona Wilson, somebody who looked sort of particularly photogenic and pleasant. I'm not saying that's not true of Pat McFadden, <laughs> yeah. but, you know, he's not in that job um, for, 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 for his looks. Oh, yes, he's photogenic that... reasons. It's yeah. not uh, exactly. Uh, I, I think that it's very normal mm -hmm. for a politician who hasn't been in a position of um, official authority to not be seen as having the stature for it. People grow into it. Not that I'm fans of theirs, but David Cameron and George Osborne were absolutely not seen by the public as prime ministerial as leaders, they were after a few months of, mm -hmm. of being in power. That's a very normal uh, pattern. Actually, it's unusual that Keir Starmer, somebody who's been in an executive role in a very big government institution, is seen as having that kind of authority. And Scarlett? I don't think that's quite right. I think, broad, I think broadly speaking, the point is true that, uh, that, that shadow cabinet always tend to have very name, low name recognition going into a general election. I don't think that's a particular concern. I think on Keir Starmer, that's not quite true. Um, I think leader of the oppositions uh, generally have a much higher profile. I know that Keir held an office, which is fairly unusual before, but uh, people like David Cameron stuff were around for a long time and I think certainly had more favourable ratings going into the election. So I don't think that part's quite true, but broadly speaking, yes. And what about charisma? Is there anybody with Riz at the moment that we can think of? I mean, people who who people will recognise, will know, and will think, oh, yeah, that's one to watch. That's somebody with a bit of razzle-dazzle that I can actually be interested in the fate of, and my own fate, I suppose. Uh, I'm up with theirs. 
Yeah, I don't know, Mar might figure, but we have some some people say they love Angela Rayner and want to see more of her. Oh, some yeah? people say no, thank you, uh, quite enough. But you know, there, there's makes, but she does come through. I'd definitely say, stand more out personality, others. isn't she? Yeah, definitely. That's the thing, and I is. think, and, and there's yeah. not that. But yeah, apart from that, the people don't tend to bring people up. Although I think it's always a good example. Uh, voters are very interesting, very nuanced, and very idiosyncratic. So to give you an example of this, we did a focus group of uh, conservative to reform voters recently, um, and uh, we asked them who their dream prime minister would be. You might think they'd say someone like Nigel Farage. Mm. No, they. Said Tom Tugendhat. Oh yeah, and David Miliband. So just to give you, you and David who Miliband, were, who isn't even in the running, and you couldn't have him if exactly. you wanted to. Exactly. Yeah. So I think it's just that's, just, great. that's a great help, yeah, isn't it? Just to remind <laughs> it, that, as well um, say Hugh Grant is exactly. going to work. Martin isn't it? Lewis, very uh, popular. He's Martin always the Lewis. most popular. Martin, answer. Martin yeah. Lewis is a good friend of mine, and would be a damn good choice actually. Mm. Oh, so. A lot of people agree. That's what yeah. it always comes. Yeah. But I'm um, so I think that's just a reminder. Balance the books. He'd probably end up making a profit. It would be absolutely staggering, wouldn't it? You know what? It wouldn't be that constitutionally difficult to have somebody from the House of Lords become Prime Minister. Again, we haven't actually officially changed the uh, the, the the rules that that uh, that totally uh, since that was last the case. So you know, maybe he's in with a chance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Coming up after the break, as the cost of sickness benefits is set to surge, we're asking our Brits work shy. I'm Vanessa Phelps. You'll we'll talk on TV, radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have moved on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back. The cost of sickness benefits in Britain is set to surge by more than a third by the end of the decade. The Office for Budget Responsibility expects health and disability handouts to rise from £65.7 billion this year to £90.9 billion by 2028 to 29. This comes as a million more people say they struggle with mental health disabilities than they did three years ago. Almost half of working age adults with a disability cite mental health as a cause and a record 2.7 million people are off work with long-term illness. So is Britain ill or is Britain work shy? Joining us to discuss this, President at the Royal College of Psychiatrists, uh, Dr Nade Smith, and Employment Law Specialist Gillian Howe. Good to see you both. Let me start with you, Dr Smith. Um, so what is going on and what is going wrong? Are we thinking that we're ill when we're not really ill? Are we pretending to be ill, knowing we're not really ill? Or are we actually mentally ill, physically ill and depleted? What is really going on here? Well, um, what we do know is that over the past 15 years, there's been a significant increase in the uh, risk factors for mental illness. There's more poverty, deprivation, housing insecurity, homelessness, loneliness, isolation, all of which are known to be associated with the development of mental illness, in particular, depression and anxiety. I think also it's very much of note that um, before, uh, you know, since the pandemic, we've seen a significant increase in the rates of depression and anxiety. And it's unsurprising, actually, when we've seen an increase in the number of uh, these, con these risk factors. And so um, we're seeing the expected, because this was predicted, we are seeing a predicted increase in the amount of mental illness. So people are really sick. They're not pretending. And and when we hear about mental illness, there's also a suggestion, I heard a doctor making it only the other day, that various situations which are simply part of the human condition, like loneliness, which you yourself mentioned, like homesickness, like insecurity, things that are part of life and will occur in everybody's life at some point, maybe repeatedly in fact, are being classified as mental illnesses when really they're simply emotional responses, perfectly normal emotional responses to the vicissitudes of an ordinary life and therefore they shouldn't be classified as such. And in fact, people ought to somehow have the resilience or be you know, be, be kind of shown how to summon the resilience to carry on working through these very difficult situations, which are very difficult, but are not mental illnesses and not, in fact, illnesses at all. Vanessa, you're absolutely right. Loneliness, isolation, uh, insecure, feeling insecure, they're not illnesses. However, as I said, they are risk factors for developing mental illness. Lots of people, in fact, three quarters of people, and as you say, everyone will experience those conditions at some point in their life. Three quarters of people don't develop mental health problems. However, one quarter of the population will experience a mental illness, a significant mental illness every year. And, that, and the problem is that this isn't a new thing. We've known this for many, many years. Mental health services have been chronically under-resourced. They're chronically understaffed, and that's been going on for many, many years. And it's actually got much worse over the last 10 years. What that means, however, is that because of the worsening risk factors that have happened over that same period of time, we've got more need and demand than we had ever before, which means that there are fewer people to treat more people, more mental illness. That means that more people are on waiting lists. So we've got 1.4 million people on our mental health waiting list. The longer a person is on the waiting list for, the more likely it is that their condition worsens. If their condition worsens, then they end up becoming so unwell that they can't work. So unwell that they may end up in crisis in A&E, and that's really costly. So unwell that they may end up even in hospital. And we are talking about conditions that are associated with self-harm and suicide. These are really serious illnesses. Let me bring uh, employment law specialist Gillian Howard into this. I mean, this is a pretty dire prognosis, isn't it? That um, mental health services, as we've known for years, are a Cinderella service, underfunded, chronically understaffed as well. And people are getting more and more mental health issues, complaints and proper Ill illnesses and syndromes, which I know because I've already spoken to you on this subject earlier, means that legitimately they cannot work. Yes, it's extremely sad and very worrying. And of course, the issues that you raised 
are causative issues. And what people are suffering from are, the, are symptoms, symptoms of anxiety, depression. Um, and there was a very interesting statistic concerning back pain, but I think it's relevant for mental illness as well, that if someone is off sick for over three months, there's only a quarter of a percent, 25% chance they'll get back to work. And if they've been away long term for six months, there's very little chance they will ever get back to work. And that's why early intervention, either by, well, also by medical services, but also by the employer. And there are an awful lot of employers that do use intervention procedures to try to assist an employee who, for whatever reason, is having symptoms of anxiety, symptoms of depression, even suicidal ideation. Um, and they are trying to intervene to help their employees so they don't stay off long term and have little chance of ever recovering or getting back to work. And those employers are very good employers and there are quite a lot of them. Let me, let me bring the, uh, the doctor back into the conversation. Doctor, so, so the prognosis here is, is exceedingly worrying because it sounds as if you're saying we don't have the means, we don't have the staff, the resources, the facilities to stall this even. We're going to have to roll with this and it's going to get worse and worse. So, um, I'd say I completely agree with Gillian. Um, there are things that can be done and Gillian said it very well. If you treat, if you treat early, you recognise the problem early and you treat early, then you can do something about it. And employers have some part to play in this because un unfortunately, when people are at work, they don't like to talk about their illnesses, especially if it's a mental illness. And, and especially if it's a mental illness, they will stay at work for much, much, much longer before they actually um, let people know that they are struggling. And if, work, if employers were to uh, create conditions that made it easier for people to talk about their problems early, early, provide support early so, and so that um, employees can get the help they need as soon as possible, then that will reduce the likelihood of people having to go off sick. And as Julian said, the longer you're off sick for, the worse the outcome, the more, the more likely it is that you won't get back into work. And what we would ask for is number one, support the government need to properly support mental health services. If they really want to tackle this issue long term, they need to properly resource mental health services so that we can treat people. Number two, we need to be able to treat people early. And that's not just from secondary mental health services, but we need primary care services, services to be supported. There are um, uh, the community services, for example, charitable services and so on. Number three, a really important thing is to try and address some of the social factors that have arisen, that have resulted in the increase in mental illness that we're seeing. Thank you both very much indeed. This is what's coming up after the break. Crippling student loans reaching hundreds of thousands of pounds. I'm Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs>
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. It has been revealed that the highest outstanding student debt in the UK stands at an eye-watering £231,000. And you did hear that correctly, £231,000. Data released by the student loans company shows the largest repayment a graduate has made tops 110000 while graduates in England leave university with average debts of just under £45,000. Joining us to discuss this, Director of the Higher Education Policy Institute, Nick Hillman. Hello, Nick. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. How unusual is a debt of that magnitude? It sounds absolutely ridiculous. Yes, I do think it's extraordinary. I mean, I've worked in higher education policy and with universities for about 15 years. And I've certainly never come across a total as high as uh, the £231,000 one. It, I think it's extraordinary. I don't quite understand how you could get a debt that high, but it could be someone, say, on an architecture course, which is a very long course, taking out the maximum tuition loan and the maximum maintenance loan. Maybe they failed a year and had to retake a year. Um, maybe, I, you know, I don't know. It is hard to uh, hard to work out how someone can get quite so much into debt. On the other hand, you know, the, 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 the normal debt, the average debt, £45,000, the average debt when a, a student graduates. I think people of a certain age and generation who were lucky enough to have, you know, free education and proper grants from the local council to make sure that they could go on their merry way and started life unencumbered by debt of that kind will find even that amount eye-watering. Um, so you better explain how you don't have to start paying it back until your salary reaches a certain level, do you? No, that's absolutely correct. This is not like other forms of debt. So it's not like having a credit card debt with the bills landing every month on your doormat. Uh, this is debt you only have to repay when you're on a, you know, when you're on an okay salary, sort of 27, 28,000 pounds is when the repayments begin. Uh, and then they they rack up as your salary goes up. So, um, and of course, when you go along for a mortgage, they don't actually ask you how much your outstanding student debt is. They do want to know how much you're paying back each month, but they don't mind if it's 45,000 or 20,000 or 60,000. So it's not quite like other forms of debt. And when I go into schools, and talk to year 12, year 13 pupils who are on their way to university, they actually have a pretty good understanding of that, which is why, of course, there are still very large numbers of students. It's not quite like any other debt, but it remains a debt, doesn't it? And some people will say a noose around your neck for your entire adult life. And when you say it doesn't kick in until you're earning £27,000, when that was originally um, uh, decided as the kind of cut-off point, that was a fairly substantial salary. Now it's actually less, isn't it, than the average salary. In other words, people will consider managing on a salary of £27,000 
difficult, a precarious life, very hard indeed to afford any kind of mortgage or even a sizable rent when you're earning £27,000. And the idea that you also have to pay your student loan off at the same time, people will think is immeasurably difficult. Is it, is it taken out of your salary? Is it taken at source? Does the government deduct it? How does it work? Yes, it is. It's taken uh, by your employer and paid direct to government in exactly the same way as income tax and national insurance. So you never uh, see that money. But of course, that is real money and it is going to the government. And you're absolutely right, of course, in this day and age, particularly if you have responsibilities, £27,000, £28,000 doesn't go as far as it used to go. Um, but you only pay on the portion above 27, 28,000 pounds. So once you get over the threshold, you're paying 9% of your salary above that level. But look, it would be great if those thresholds could go up. I've got to say, all the political parties pretty much are reluctant to make many commitments at all about higher education this side of a general election. So I don't think people should plan on the basis that those numbers are going to change. Um, but uh, look, uh, the other thing to bear in mind, though, is that if you go to university and you get a degree, and most people who go to university, it works out very well for them, the chances are you will be in a better paid job than if you'd never gone. You're much less likely to be unemployed. Employers are crying out to recruit skilled graduates. So I wouldn't, uh, you know, th there are arguments on both sides, but university degrees still work out very, very well for the overwhelming majority of people who do go to university. So, of course, as I went to university and all the people who didn't go watching and listening will feel exactly the same. I think, Vanessa, you're at no advantage at all because I was aware of this too. You didn't need a university degree to realise that this gentleman is treading very, very carefully. You can't say categorically you will be better off financially if you have a university degree. That's why you didn't say it. You said in most cases, in many cases, overwhelmingly, it is considered to be a jolly good thing financially if you have a degree. But you can't say categorically that it means you're going to be better financially set up for life than if you don't, because you know it's not true and you're a charming person. You wouldn't dream of saying anything dishonest on my show. That's why you're tempering so carefully and so elegantly what you say. In other words, it can't be guaranteed that this loan with which you're saddled from the age of 21, a £45,000 upward loan that you're going to have to pay back, it's a debt hanging around your neck for, for however long it takes you to pay it back. You can't say that you offset it against your earnings and you're going to be shown to be happily and profitably in the money. And so you could see why people would tread with great trepidation, particularly um, young people from financially straightened backgrounds who will just think, blimey, you know, I don't, I don't know how I'm ever going to pay that back. And, and you can see, therefore, that the thing that everybody desires, which is the utmost social mobility, might be desperately hindered and hampered by this with good reason. Well, everything you say is correct. I, I love universities, but university is not right for everybody. There's about a million undergraduates at any point in time. And as I said before, it's working out for most of them, but it won't work out for all of them. And I do urge young people thinking about higher education and thinking about the other options to make their decisions very carefully and to do their research fully. Um, but when, you know, look, I wouldn't be doing the job I do, and I have a very fulfilling uh, career working in policy uh, if I didn't have a degree. The teachers in my children's schools wouldn't have a job without their degrees. The new nurses in my local hospital wouldn't have their jobs without a degree. So there are all sorts of careers that are closed off to you if you don't have a degree. And that's great if the careers where you don't need a degree uh, are fulfilling for you. Uh, but there are lots where, you know, things have change now. You can't be a nurse pretty much without a degree, for example, whereas in the old days you could be. Mm -hmm. And lots of people think that's a bad thing, as you know. Thank you very much indeed for joining Thank me. You. Very good to have your take on this. Coming up after the break, we're going to have more on the ongoing investigation into the reported breach of the Princess of Wales's medical data. I'm Vanessa Phelps and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl.
when JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. That's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Well, it's time for a Royal Roundup now, and you may well have seen the delightful footage of Queen Camilla and that charming little boy Fitzwilliam in Northern Ireland. She seemed so much to enjoy his company and the fact that he was so photogenic and so at ease with the cameras. And he was there in his parents' bakery having the absolute time of his life, all dressed up in a tuxedo. Turns out that his mum is Zoe Salmon, the former Blue Peter presenter. She's also a former Miss Northern Ireland and she dressed her little boy up. She said they were just going along to give a little bit of support to the family business and who knew that he was going to turn out to be one of the cosmic, huge television stars. And joining us to discuss this, Talk TV's world correspondent Rupert Bell. Hello, Rupert. This is Queen Camilla at her very best, isn't it? Jolly and smiling and thoroughly enjoying whatever happens. Yes, and she's had to step up to the plate, obviously, with, since the King's diagnosis with cancer. And he was expected to be there, as he was in the Isle of Man, earlier in the week. But this is the kind of feel-good photo op that you actually want to see the royal family out and about and a little cheeky chappy sort of stealing the show. But the one thing, the Queen Camilla won't take umbrage at that at all. She will love every minute of that because she wants to be seen that it's a natural environment. My goodness me, the cakes look very good at that particular bakery, um, I have to say, um, um, whatever they're producing. But the, the little lad was definitely the, the star of the show. And actually, the royal family need more of these pictures, seeing Queen Camilla out and about and other members of the royal family out and about, bringing uh, a little bit of uh, lightness, well, smiling to the public who are around watching them. Absolutely. So this was the, the Queen at the bakery. And then she went on, you might say, to the butcher, the baker and the candlestick maker, because she did visit um, a, a lovely family butcher business where she was very, very enthusiastic. And they loaded up her shopping basket with all manner of sausages and lamb chops and goodness knows what. And she said, I'm going to take them back to the king and he will do full justice to them. 
Well, he, he likes his, his food, and actually, because it's locally produced, that's very much part of the king's DNA, likes to see people eating food that has been produced in a, in a local environment. And, and again, those, the food looked terrific, and, and um, going into a, a local shop like that, um, a testament to the skill of this particular butcher. But it, it shows that the king would have been there, and he would have loved to have seen that, as I say, because he... He loves that when, when you look at what he does at Highgrove, that mm. the local ethos is very much part of his mantra for producing food. It certainly is. And, and, and Queen Camilla really does seem to have a very easy, you might say effortless, and I'm going to ask you about this before I say it, kind of effortless way with the public. She makes nice jokes. She likes children. She adored that little boy, Fitzwilliam. She really basked in his company and had a good laugh and really kind of bonded with his parents. And, you know, does this kind of thing, it appears, I'm going to say, effortlessly, but you will know much more than I do about what her real personality is like, because some people have suggested that really she's quite shy and it's not necessarily quite as easy for her as we might think it is. I think initially she probably did feel like I'm in the spotlight, uh, but she's grown into her role and, and seems to relish it and has taken on the, the matter along with her sister-in-law, the Princess Royal, to get on with the job. And that's very much, it's a sort of no-nonsense approach. I'm here, I'm going to enjoy it, and I'm going to do the best job I can. And that's what you see. What you see is what you get. She's 76 years of age, don't forget, as well. And so she's come to the sort of real spotlight in her, in her, in her position now since her husband ascended to the throne. But, and with all the difficulties, she does seem to have taken a sort of no-nonsense approach and going to do the best job she can. And it's always been a, a, a feeling that whenever she's turned up, people appreciate what she's done. She's had some of her causes are quite difficult ones and, and in terms of what the, the messaging and what she's trying to achieve. But when she's just going out in a glad-handing role like this, she goes at it with a sort of very determined approach to say, right, I'm here and I hope you're going to have a good time and I'm going to make sure people feel appreciated when I'm there because of my visit. And she's immensely grounded, isn't she? She hung on to her own house, Ray Mill House, and you imagine that she escapes there very frequently. And when she's there, she can be her real self, a real person in her own house. I don't know whether she has any people looking after her, whether she has, you know, somebody who does, a lady who cleans up after her, but she's, you know, not surrounded by staff or protocol. And she can hang out with her own children, her own grandchildren, like any other grandma and mum. And you think that might help her very much in her endeavours in public? I think that's what she wants, that sort of way that she does have this other family. I mean, she referenced the Louis uh, that had a, a grandson, um, and she does have a Louis by, a, by her daughter uh, called Louis, and then obviously um, her, her, grand, her step-grandson is obviously the, another cheeky chap as we began this interview talking about Prince Louis. Uh, maybe that young lad in the, in the baker's shop has, has seen the Prince Louis move... Uh, uh, public appearances and as, as mirroring him. But I think the point is for Queen Camilla, she does need that area, getting away from the trappings of royalty. I'm sure she has got a lady who helps look after her, manages her, her life, uh, and it is a very managed life when you're in this position. But she knows it is important for her to, to have that downtime and sort of kick back with her family and, and relax, because it is a pressure keg of a role. And it for all members of the royal family, it may be that you can just turn up and put on a happy face. It's in people say, well, well, that's what they're paid to do. Rupert, it's thank you very much forward. indeed. Have a great weekend. Lots more coming up now after this short break. Never mind the ballot. A brand new look at all things politics from The Sun with me, Harry Cole. Watch my big into the week with no stone unturned. Every Thursday evening, exclusively with The Sun. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. I mean, there's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such as the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. They said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> 
Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, sir. Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fort.